to clarify, right? Because maybe the people who pay who pay me would be happy for this, I suppose. I don't really work at Xiamen University, which which is uh, in the main campus is in China. I actually work in Malaysia. So so Xiamen University recently opened a physics department in in its Malaysian campus. This is where I sit most of my time. And, and I also have a, a, a little attachment to the University of Gdańsk in Poland. And exactly, as Prof. Banerji said, my, my kind of main topic of interest in the recent years is something that I call the mediated dynamics. And today, I really just would like to show you that, you know, this is of interest, like I, and you're very welcome to, to think about it. And in particular, I'm going to talk about certain non-classical features of states in mediated dynamics that I'm going to introduce in next slide and, and as well as processes. So I mean this thing. So a mediated dynamics would be, a, let's say in the simplest case, the tripartite settings where you have three particles and they are arranged in this way that A and B do not talk to each other directly. So you could kind of distinguish two scenarios, like broadly speaking, and I will really, my talk will, this is also the agenda, my talk will follow this line I will first tell you a few words about something that people used to call discrete in time, which is supposed to mean that this mediator is first interacting with Alice, so first time, and then later in a sequence, it is brought to another side and it interacts with, with, with another particle, particle B. So here, here we have a nice theorem in mean, the community has, there is a, a number of people contributed to this that, that quantifies, uh, correlations, let's say you could get in this kind of setting. And I want really to, to show you this first, because I feel we are lacking something similar in the continuous case. So that will be my, my, my to do, right? Or for you guys to, to think over, a problem to think over. So I, I kind of stepped into this because what I like about this is that it's very abstract in a sense. So, you know, I will be just talking about three objects, A, B, C without really specifying what exactly is that. If you want to have something concrete in mind, which always helps, I think, you can, you can think about all the Himadri's examples with, with these hybrid systems. There you had some kind of system one, another physical system two, and there was something he was calling a quantum bus. So that would be a particular incarnation of this abstract scheme. But I really will be interested in this talk about very generic general properties of this tripartite setting in, in, in standard quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. All right. So, so and my one more general comment before I move on is I stepped into this because it's, it, you can already see that most likely it should be possible to say something about this guy in the middle, the mediator, the thing I call C in this talk, without actually measuring it. So really the situations that, that where I will be going via a sequence of steps is that I would like to conclude something about C without measuring it by just looking at the data measured on A and B. So that's, that's where we're going. Let me start with this discrete in time scenario, which people also call, of course, quantum communication because this is nothing else by exchange of quantum particles. So wait, let me try to get rid of this line here. First things first. So if you if you kind of think about this scenario in terms of in terms of information transfer, it's it's kind of similar to what we are doing now. I'm A, you are B, and how is it that you can hear me is because there is a bunch of physical systems that go from, from Malaysia after interacting with my local laptop via internet to you, right? And uh, it's not hard to show that in terms of, in terms of information quantities, the, the information that you have after the communication, so where this particle C is in, in the right lab, is in with you, right? So A versus CB. Think about the situation as the guy on the left is laboratory A, or labor, left laboratory. Everything on the right is the right laboratory. So then the final situation is the one where C is already with you with the, in the right laboratory. So information A between with C and B together minus the initial information where C is still still on the left laboratory in the left laboratory, AC versus B. It's not hard to prove 
mathematically, and you can you can look at the proof, for example, in this paper, that this is always bounded by a b versus c. So just use a chain rule essentially, and you're there. And it's really I like this a lot because this one is super simple to interpret. So what this is telling you is something very natural. The information gain caused by them by moving this particle c from one uh, labora laboratory to another is bounded by how much information this c is carrying. How, how, how many correlations are there to see? Very natural thing. If this wouldn't hold, you would probably even not call your, your, your information measure as information. Right? This is what we would expect for, from reasonable information measures. Could be a defining property of it in a sense. right? So a very natural quantity, and therefore it, it takes no time to, to ask if this is true for any other correlation. Sounds, sounds really natural. Sounds like there should not be free lunch. Like we, when you, I say in entanglement, say it sounds like the entanglement gain between two laboratories should be bounded by how much entanglement you, you are communicating. And it is known since the time, since exactly 20 years, and there is a similar paper by Toby Qubit and others, that this is actually not the case. The, in this setting, the final entanglement minus initial entanglement, it's not bounded by how much entanglement you communicate. It turns out it's actually bounded by how much discord you communicate. And that, that, was, that was shown in these two papers. And just to remind you, it's, it's funny in a sense, because it, there seems that the, the, there kind of is some way of relaunch here. And let me remind you what these things are. So entangled states are those that you cannot write in this way. So where these, you know, the, I think I won't go into, into this description too much. The discorded, I believe everyone knows since this is the quantum info conference, the discorded states are, so the states which do not have discord are a subclass of separable states. So there's, for tripartite systems, this would be the ones where you require only orthogonal states on, on, on one of the party. So in particular, what you learn here is that since this zero discord states are a subset of separable states, of not entangled states. And theoretically, right, if you if that inequality were tight and it turns out, I mean, this one here with the discord bound, and it turns out it is actually tight in many cases, you should be able to entangle two laboratories that have never ever exchanged an entanglement. So a funny possibility, right, free lunch. At the same, at the same time, and this is what I, what I really want to emphasize here more, is that what I like about it is that it is a quantitative statement. So imagine you, you somehow manage to entangle two laboratories, right? And you see that, or entangle that you have some entanglement gain in this sense that the final entanglement A versus CB minus the initial entanglement AC versus B is somehow not zero. This communication of particle really brought some entanglement into the game, some extra entanglement. Then you automatically know that you not only know that there is discord in this, in this particle C carries this discord, but you actually also know how much, right? It has to be at least this amount. So that, that's what I mean by the quantitative statement. That's, that's the, and this is something that will be lacking in the, in the continuous time scenario. And then I encourage you to think about it. So here it's nice because you can make this quantitative statement. The interesting possibility is indeed interesting, and I wanted to spend a slide or two just to just to remind you if you have heard about it, or just to tell you if you haven't heard about it. How is that possible? Because at first sight, it is kind of uh, intriguing, let's say, right? That it is possible to entangle laboratories which have not exchanged any entanglement, and essentially the trick is the following: that if you have tripartite quantum states, then there exist states. With, with, for example, with this property, and actually, yeah, so let me let me first cover this. There exist states with this property, so where you do not have any entanglement in two of two of three possible bipartitions, for example, these two, and you do have entanglement in the remaining one. So here, the interpretation would be the following, right? That the first guy is telling you that you are not communicating entanglement. The particle C is not entangled with AB. The initial entanglement where C is on the left is also zero. So you started with zero entanglement, you communicated zero entanglement, and yet the final entanglement is still positive. There are such states. And if, you, if you're interested in how to construct them exactly, this is, this is uh, in this paper, for example. So this is where we constructed many such states. 
and also Alistair K, for example, also constructed many of them. So this was sufficiently funny that people started looking at this experimentally. And one year later, there were three free papers from, from different continuous variable, uh, for from in optics, essentially, from continuous variable communities and for, for qubit communities, communities. And they just brought this here because it's funny that Actually, and I took part in, in this experiment as well. I was, I mean, just discussing with these people, saying what, what could be measured here. And we, no one of us, and looks like also no one of these continuous variable people were aware that, that two years after the seminal paper by Qubit, there was a Chinese group who already demonstrated this in, uh, in the NMR setup. So, so usually you could, some people complain about this NMR setups, but I guess I, I won't complain too much. If you, if you really are kind of discussing the, who was the first one to demonstrate this effect, there is this Chinese group who did it a bunch of years before this optics experiments. So this is my first part, right? So I want to really summarize this by saying that in the, in the discrete uh, interactions case, where you bring one particle from the left lab to the right lab, you, people have derived the nice inequalities that characterize how much entanglement you can gain in this way. And, and they can be used to, to, to say, to automatically state some sort of non-classicality of the involved states in terms of this part. They give you the lower bound on the this part that is being communicated here. So let's move on to continuous case. Similarly, one can prove, and we showed this a uh, bunch of years later, that in when you move to this free setting, free particles that are now continuously via some Hamiltonians interacting in this way that A and B are not interacting, everything happens via C. You can prove that if your discord is zero at all times, so imagine that you evolve this system from time zero to time t. Mm, then entanglement in this particular bipartition A versus B C or B versus AC, it cannot grow, which is, which is kind of funny, but what I, what, what I'm, I somehow, I came to, to this, I, I wanted to study this setting because of this possibility that you could say something about C without measuring it. So that, that, that I think is the funny, funny, funny part of this setup, right? Try to conclude something about objects that are inaccessible to you just by coupling them to the objects that you can measure. This, this is the, kind of the interesting part of it, to me at least. So, so we wanted to really make statements about C from the data that you only measure at A and B. And here you see that this discord business doesn't work anymore. So, so it is not the case. You can actually entangle these particles A and B via, via classical, in a sense, that zero discord mediator. And, and, and an example is the following, the simplest that we were, that we were able to find. B, you don't know it because this AB is classically correlated to the mediator. It's, there is some kind of a label at the mediator. If the label is plus, then the AB is in the psi plus state. If the label is minus, then AB is in phi plus state. So you see that indeed there is no discord here because the, the discord, the, vanish, the states with vanishing discord were such that I was able to write them using orthogonal basis. And here I have an orthogonal basis and plus and minus, say, spin probably x eigenbasis. So if you take this initial state, then initially you have no entanglement at AB because one can prove that this kind of mixture of bell diagonal states with equal weights does not carry any entanglement. And now let me interact this system. Let, let's, let's allow the system to flow in time with the following energy. So that, uh, so first of all, it conforms to this picture. There is only AC coupling and BC coupling. So AC and BC, there's no AB coupling. And I choose them in this way, right? XX and XX. So you can, you can solve this dynamics and you will, you will learn that indeed entanglement grows. You can even get maximally entangled state between A and B. Where, where no entanglement in, in AB, and you manage to get a maximally entangled state at AB, whereas at all times the mediator C was classical. So you could you you may be wondering, Craig, is this against LOCC or something? That where this, this, uh, there is a form of local local interaction at least, right? A interacts with C, A does not interact with B, and the same here. 
and it is not against. Note that actually at all times we had entanglement already from the scratch, from the time from time zero, but it was in a different partition. It was in A versus BC. If you if you compute how much entanglement you have between A and BC together, or between B and AC together, it is equal to one in say for log for, ne for logarithmic negativity, and it stays the same at all times. So really, what happens here is that entanglement that has been in this in this bipartite splitting A versus BC or B versus AC was actually brought into the subsystem of AB via classical C, which still is probably a funny, funny phenomenon. So, so I'm so so this was demonstrated in in the group of Mahesh in in Pune in NMR experiments, where. I, where they use a really, really nice example of yet another kind of, in addition to, to Himadri's um, examples, here's another one, right? So they have a nice mediated dynamics. They have a molecule, and this molecule looks like this, dibromofluoromethane or something like that is, is the name of this. And it has the hydrogen on one side and fluor, fluor on the other side and, and, and carbon in the middle. And what you see here is the bond structure. So most of the interactions are really here, right? AC in, a, in my language, right, of this talk, and BC. And, and essentially, there is not much interaction between, between H and F. But in practice, there actually is a bit. Because if you have this kind of bond, then the electric charges are, so the electrons are actually mostly on the side of the carbon. So you have a net, net charge uh, on the other side. And this interacts with F. But in this experiment, this was taken into account, and 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 we you know, we could argue that really the entanglement has been brought from from this A versus B C system to to only F and H via via classical C, and we say it via classical because in the experiment what they have done they have actually defaced this this carbon nucleus uh, at at particular at, at some times. So, so really, there is no doubt that this was via classical C. Classical meaning that at all times, the states of C could be described by one orthogonal basis. So, so I like this a lot. It's a nice, nice demonstration. And, and it really shows you that you have to be a bit more careful if you want to make statements about C from just, inter from just A and B, looking at the dynamics of A, B only. And oh, in the same paper, Tanjun Krishnanda was 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 able to prove that in this kind of scenarios where 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 you uh, where the dynamics is via via classical mediators, where you can always at all times use one and the same basis for the mediator, it turns out that entanglement really in a B partition, right, at time t minus the initial entanglement is always bounded by by mutual information with with the mediator at time zero. So that that kind of nicely generalizes uh, this discord bound, but I think I won't won't really dig into this. Let me move on. That, but anyway, there is a quantitative statement here as well, but it is only for the case of classical mediators. So it would be really nice to generalize this to whatever mediator. Okay, so so as you see, the initial state is important, and and then. Once we learn that, we, we manage to overcome this via some, via some, uh, some tricks that, that are described in the appendix <laughs> of, this, of this paper. And, it, and you can derive, actually, again, an implication, one-way condition that shows you, which is independent of the initial state, that uh, has the following form, that if entanglement at time AB, if, if entanglement AB at time T, is gr greater than the sum of initial entropies only in the subsystem AB, so now all the quantities are really measured at A and B only, then it must be that somehow during this dynamics, the, the mediator is non-classical. You cannot describe it using one and only uh, orthogonal basis. So the discord must, must be zero. So, so that, that's really one of the, my main results that I wanted to share with you is that that you can measure things on AB only and make, con make conclusions about, about the mediator without touching it. And note that this is not only without touching it, but really with making minimalistic assumptions about it. It, it can be in inaccessible because I have not fixed any Hilbert space dimension in these derivations. It could even be continuous variable system. I have not stated what exactly these Hamiltonians are. They can be whatever you like. 
The, the assumption here is that A and B do not interact. There is no Hamiltonian HAB. Once this is the case, you don't, do not have to know this HAC and HBC. Well, the observation of this, of this uh, if, you, if you see in the lab that your entanglement at time t is greater than the sum of initial entropies, you already can conclude that the discord was non-zero for whichever Hamiltonian. So, and now after this kind of a bit of fight, right, you, we, could, we, we managed to get this state independent version, which doesn't depend on the initial state. And it turns out you could even open each one of the system to its local environment, because it's essentially a statement about entanglement. So you probably feel that as, as, as long as this is a local operation, right, you, you can allow some local environments, as long as these local environments do not talk to each other, the same bound can still be obtained. Okay, so, so this, this was essentially my major part about this uh, generic generic systems where ABC can be whatever you like, and no fixed silver space dimension, no explicit form of interactions, no knowledge about the initial state, each system can be open. So let me let me move to some examples. And the first one, uh, so as, as I promised, right, the first one, let me just say that, that it will be in biology. And the moment when we when we wrote this paper, this 2017 paper, I saw a talk by, by Vladko Vedral, where he contributed to this to this nice experiments where people have put bacteria. These are photosynthetic bacteria. They typically live in uh, in extremely dark places somewhere in deep waters. So what they have done, they have developed a uh, an antennas that are very light sensitive. So sometimes people even claim that these guys rely on single photons to to be alive. They, they really can, they have to capture all the energy that comes, that comes into in, in this darkness. So essentially what, what this experiment is about is that you're taking these bacteria and you're putting them in a cavity and you're shining light onto this cavity and you're monitoring how much light goes through to, to work out how these bacteria interact with different, with different frequencies of your light. But that's not all. Actually, it turns out these bacteria, this is the, the green thing, the green spectrum is the, is, is, is the absorption spectrum of these bacteria. And the blue spectrum is the, is the absorption spectrum of certain dye that has this property that when it only enters into dead cells or alive, I never remember what one of, one of the two, right? Let's say that. So what these guys have done is that first of all they they uh, they measured that via looking at these intensity profiles they 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 demonstrated that there is a strong coupling between the light that they shine and these bacterial um, antennas and and second of all because they didn't so let's say that they have seen so the dye works like this. If it enters into the cell, it binds with the cell and it no longer, no longer shines. It would, you wouldn't see this spectrum. You, you wouldn't see this peak anymore. And since they actually have seen this, have seen this, so, so here's an example, right? They had a bunch of dead cells, let's say, that didn't shine and a bunch of living cells which, which did shine, right? Because the, because the, because the living cell, uh, the membrane of the living cell does not allow this dye in. So essentially, by looking at this blue fluorescence, they were they were able to argue that during this experiment, during this strong coupling, the, the animal was alive because, because the dye didn't enter. So, so Vladko and, and, and that group, they tried to model this in terms of in terms of some entanglement and this kind of properties with, the, with apparently a living, living creature, but it is known. I think I don't have it here, but it is known from the from the 80s, essentially, where people were looking at at, at how oscillators at, at this kind of va vacuum Rabi splitting. Uh, there is a known model in, in 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 terms of classical oscillators that can explain this kind of spectra. So so then when I when when he said, and of course they openly say this, right? This is nothing. It's it's just you know if you really really strict right there is this classical model in terms of oscillators and there's nothing you can do about it it explains the data so so when i saw this i i thought that oh but this is uh, vladko I, I think i know how to how to help here in a sense because look you could you could have an unambiguous uh, what i just told you was a method with abc right and and it unambiguously tells you that that once you observe entanglement gain between A and B, 
then you know that there was some discord as measured on this on this guy in the middle, right? And as would be measured, you don't actually have to measure it. You make a statement from the data on A and B only, right? So the idea would be that you put this bacteria where they were sitting, right, into, into this cavity, and you shine, for example, two orthogonal polarizations. And two orthogonal polarizations are orthogonal, so they don't interact with, the, with each other. The two orthogonal polarizations would be A and B, the two modes of light. They don't talk to each other. If you manage to observe any entanglement between these A and B modes, that would be because they were coupled through these antennas in, the, in these bacteria. So if you went and managed to entangle them, that would show that somehow these antennas were, were having non-zero discord. The whole tripartite system was having non-zero discord. So antennas themselves would, would, be, would have to be described using non-orthogonal states, some sort of coherence. So the actual calculations were done in a bit different way because uh, we weren't sure if you how if really such such cavities exist whereas it for it is for sure that you can have cavities for for many different frequency modes so so Tanjong mate and and Vla, and again with with Vladko with 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 Mauro Paternostro Chiara Merletto, so the whole team right we made this we made this uh, simulations but really mainly Tanjong where the modeling is done in this way that the bacteria are modeled based on their spectrum. So there would be two kind of uh, ensembles, let's say, in, in Himadri's language, right? That, that of, of, of charges, right? That can couple to external fields. The fields are fields. And, and then you have a coupling between them. And because they have observed strong coupling, you actually cannot, cannot write the James Cummings model, but you have to write also those terms that do not preserve energy. And there is a pumping. So, so, so you can work it out. Everything is in this paper. And the net result is that, uh, unfortunately, and when we were considering only two modes, the simplest experiment that comes to mind, you do not get any steady state entanglement. And there is entanglement there, but very short living. In, in the, it dies in a few femtoseconds. However, there is actually, so, so in order to see the steady state entanglement, we had to move to four modes. So four different frequencies for the for the line that goes into the cavity, and then and then there is some entanglement, but it's very small. This is logarithmic negativity. So, for comparison, state of the art experiments can measure one over a hundred. So this guy is like one order of magnitude smaller, and and it's more tricky, I believe, to to do this kind of experiment. It's funny that you actually have a lot of entanglement in this setup. If you if you look into entanglement between the light and this and this bacterial modes, let's say the the, the ensembles there, it's a lot, like oh, 0 0.1. But however, if you know after tracing out this this these bacteria, so when you really look only at the modes, it's it's not much, right? So it's it's hard to look. It's a challenging experiment. I think Vladko was actually talking to the to the Sheffield people who have conducted the, the previous experiment, and they they were not interested. In, in doing this, it, it's complicated, right, and tricky. But there is a nice side product that I wanted to tell you here, that in, in, this, in this experiment, the essentially, I think the light that they use, it's, uh, it's just some white light, I think, from, from some essentially classical source. So then, then we were thinking with, with, with Rainer Dunk and, and, and people at NTU, you know, that it would be nice to, to conduct this kind of experiment where you have a, some arguably living creature that talks to, to an unambiguously quantum system. And, and then the idea was that something that is clearly unambiguously quantum would be a qubit, right? So say a superconductor, superconducting qubit. In Reiner's lab, they, they had these qubits and it's, it's kind of very unfriendly in, in a very unfriendly atmosphere. So, so at almost you know, very low pressure, the temperatures are just fractions of a Kelvin. So we were looking if there would be any animal that, that had a chance of somehow surviving this, 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 um, this conditions. And, and then we found that there, that there are those tardigrades. So there, is, there, are, there are eight legs animals, mainly living in water. That, that were even shot into space and, and managed to survive and, and come back. So they really, they, they, they are kind of very fine with very, very low pressures and, and very low temperatures. And the, the, their trick is that they would, they, would, they would take all of the, they would kind of pack their body into a smaller piece of matter, let's say, that, that is essentially 
are metabolic. It doesn't, in a sense, it doesn't live, right? But but then, so so this is what what was done in this experiment. You can you can you can take a look, and of course, I, I invite you very much to, to take a look at this. Take a look at the at the social media. People have have discussed this. A bit, we we try to answer some of some of these things also in finally in the published paper paper, and the, so so what happens here is that you have this this ametabolic uh, tardigrade next to a superconducting qubit, and and we try to to argue from the data that plus some assumptions again that uh, that it has been entangled. So a side effect of this bio experiments. And the second second thing that the, that uh, that I would like to say a few words on is that another, another recently uh, very much discussed topic was in was entang uh, gravitational entanglement. So you could you so actually we already wrote this also in this original paper um, that in principle you could apply this also to, uh, this this methodology let's say to this uh, to, to gravity where you would you would think in this tripartite terms that you have some mass some other mass and 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 the gravity would be described by a Hilbert space. Let's say that you try to model it like this. Then then when you see entanglement between A and B, imagine that you see it in the lab that is larger than the initial sum of entropies. You, from this model here, from, from the theory, you conclude that there, was, there, have been, there has to be some discord as would be measured at C. So the states of this Hilbert space describing the gravitational mode would not do, could not be orthogonal. That wouldn't, that wouldn't match this, the, your observation of entanglement. And you know why this is, important is because all of all of our why this 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 kind of experiment where people people try to look at at, at entanglement in the gravitational setting i really believe probably like all the others that they are very important because all the experiments with quantum particles and gravity that uh, that we have been doing we meaning physicist community we have been doing we're using the gravity of the earth up to now and there you have a huge object, right? That uh, with its gravitational field, and we of course observe that particles. It doesn't matter what is their size, even those super tiny particles, they fall. They 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 have they have they give rise to certain phase shifts. You know, as as you can read here, there's uh, the milestone experiments. The point is that the gravitational field of the Earth does not feel any any back action from the from these microscopic pa particles you could just think it is one and the same field at all the time so you could treat it as either a fixed newtonian background or some fixed space time it, it's one and the same at all times it's really hard to argue there is anything non-classical here so this kind of setting where you have two comparable masses not one huge one small but two comparable masses that are being entangled is is perhaps the simplest one or one one of the simpler scenarios where you could actually go you, and study quantum features of gravitational interaction. And because of this, you have this many, many topics. So probably many, many papers, probably most famous is by Bose and, and all the other, all, all the other co-authors by Marletto, Vedral, many other people contributed to this, either computing actual entanglement in various settings or, or the coherence rates providing some conceptual advances. So for example, going beyond just quantum formalism as, as I have told you here, right? So all of this is within the framework, framework of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So, so people try to argue using some more general models and so on, right? So, so it's all here. What, where I want to go today in this remaining 10 minutes or so is note that all of this except I think one recent paper from, from Plenius group is fo focused on non-classical states. So let me now finish with the last thought is that you could actually also think about using correlations between A and B to determine whether these Hamiltonians are classical or not, whether the interactions are classical. And that's, that's what, what we were thinking. So these are our thoughts about this with Reganardi and, and, and uh, Ekta, Sweta, and Bianca from the Gdańsk team. They, um, so our definition of classicality of, of these interactions is when Hamiltonians commute. So that's, that's, 
that's what we say. So when they don't commute this AC and BC, then we say that the interactions are non-classical. And kind of high level motivation for this is that in classical mechanics, everything, all the observables commute. And furthermore, the, the, we call it classical. We call this commuting Hamiltonians classical because you can show that they would actually preserve the zero discord state. So classical states would evolve under this classical Hamiltonians into classical states. So it's kind of a nice consistency in the whole picture. So that's our definition. We take, we take it, we say that the interactions, these mediated interactions are classical if the, if the Hamiltonians with the mediator commute. And now, now let, me, let me show you a really simple example how correlations could reveal that Hamiltonians do not commute. So think about entanglement again, right? So for a moment, let's assume that we have commuting interactions. So classical in my in in this sense. So you could, so although the in the lab, right, the systems are actually continuously in time interacting like this, right? A with C and B with C. All at all times there is this coupling. Mathematically, effectively because these Hamiltonians commute, you could think that first A interacts with C and then B interacts with C. So kind of back like this, or this, this discrete in time business. You first A with C, then you move C and then B with C or in reverse order doesn't matter because they commute. In any case, so you see that it, uh, you immediately kind of recognize that um, what could be the best protocol for entangling? What you would, how, how much entanglement can you get via such operations? Well, it's you probably the best is when you maximally entangle A with C, then you bring C to the other side and you swap that entanglement. It's hard to imagine you can get more. And really, this is what we, what we proved is that uh, this, is really, this is really optimal. So it turns out kind of intuitively, as, as I hope I have convinced you that this is really the best you can do. It's kind of very clear, right? You entangle A and C, you swap this on the other side. So essentially, you cannot get gain more and more. So this, this way produces as much entanglement as mediator can carry, right? that there is some sort of capacity to this. So for example, if you look into logarithmic negativity, then it is well known that entanglement between two objects is bounded by the smaller dimension. So if you choose, and uh, so then if the Hamiltonians commute, you expect that entanglement between A and B would be bounded by entanglement to the mediator, the, which, which is, if you take the mediator to be of smaller dimension than dimension of A, would be DC, log of DC. High five. If you actually have more complicated initial states, then, and you can also generalize this. So this is really race work where he really put it rigorously in mathematical terms and was able to prove that for any correlation measure that kind of is reasonable, continuous, monotonic under local operations, you can prove that really this, this maximal, maximal correlations to the mediators, so the capacity, let's say, is, is the limit. And if you start with, with states that are already correlated, then you have some correction, but this is really, I'm going to ignore it in this talk. So nice, we have, we have kind of a natural bound, the capacity, let's say, but is it useful? Can you violate it? And yes, you can. And really the simple example is again, this entangling business, because imagine that your DC is smaller than the dimension of A or B, strictly smaller. Then the implication, I just repeated it here, is that entanglement between AB under this assumption is always bounded by log DC. But if somehow you manage to observe that your uncorrelated ABC state got maximally entangled between AB and whatever something else at C, then entanglement between AB is log DA, which by this assumption is stronger. So it can't be. So all maximally entangling dynamics must necessarily be non-commuting. You cannot maximally entangle with commuting Hamiltonians. So how come, right? So you can then ask, so how the hell can you violate this, this, this uh, fairly natural bound again, right? The, the, the capacity bound in a sense. So how much, how much, and how much mediator can carry? How can you, how can you beat this bound? How come that this maximally entangling dynamics is actually violating this, 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 uh, this limit? And uh, 
I think the way I understand it is this, that when you have non-commuting Hamiltonians, their, their, their dynamics is really very different in this sense. So mathematically, maybe let's start with maths. Mathematically, this in general, this, uh, this evolution operator can no longer be split into a sequence of UAC and UBC at least not just one sequence. The actual mathematical description is so-called Trotter-Suzuki Trotter expansion or, or formula, and it looks like this. So you see that if you have non-commuting Hamiltonians, you have to think about many more exchanges. So it is as if A was interacting with C for a short time, delta T here is T, the whole dynamics divided by N, so T over N, and then C interacts with B for the time T over N, then it kind of comes back to A and it interacts with A again for the time T over N and you have infinitely many such very short exchanges. So this tripartite dynamics, if you really kind of want to have a sequential picture of it or some effective picture of it, you can no longer think about it as just one sequence, but it's infinitely many sequences. So A goes, interacts for a short time here, goes, goes to the right, interacts for a short time, come back, comes back, interacts for a short time, goes to B, interacts for a short time, and this continues. So while in each and every run, the, the capacity bound of course holds, the non-commutativity leads to many exchanges and therefore it could accumulate correlations to above the bound. Okay. And so that, that's kind of, and we, all of actually all of these ideas or most of these ideas are in our paper from 2018 already where we also gave some 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 more practical examples than maximal entanglement if you look into into two cavity modes coupled via Jane's Cummings uh, Hamiltonians and you do it you see that the bounded entanglement is given by the dimension of the mediator so we want to keep that small so we put a two level atom as the mediator but we put in principle infinitely dimensional modes continuous variables as as this a and b so this is a setup where where you you know, the first one that comes to your mind when you really want to see a violation and then whichever there is still, so here is the example right for many different correlation measures you could choose mutual information some sort of classical correlations even suitably defined negativity, travela, all of them, you can, you can show that for all of them, there is some violation. So, so James Cummings Hamiltonians do not commute as you can easily convince yourself. And you could prove it by doing, by looking at correlations between A and B. And what's funny, actually the dipole, dipole interactions do commute. So if you, if you were to change from this James Cummings to a, to a strong limit where you have A plus A dagger and, and uh, so, Sigma sigma plus plus sigma minus, right? Then those uh, those those two Hamiltonians would be commuting. Then, so it's interesting that actually James Cummings, in principle, provides you with a higher in a higher entanglement. But this, in strong coupling, you would get lower entanglement but faster, because that the, the, there is more in energy, so so the evolution is faster. So, if, by the way, if there are some experimentalists in the audience, that uh, I think is probably an, an interesting also thing to measure, right? If you, if someone has an ability to tune these interactions from weak to strong, it's funny that strong interactions do not lead to as high entanglement as weak. All right, so, so let's say three more minutes, please allow me, and, and at most five. Let me apply all of this, all of this interaction, non-classicality of interaction story to, to gravity again. So what, what we have derived here is that, again, I want to make statements just by measuring A and B, just the masses, right? The gravitational field is inaccessible. No, you know, what, what does that measure to measure? What does that mean to measure gravitational field? You would usually do it by coupling and other objects, right? So that's that, that Hilbert space is without is, doesn't have experimental. You, you can't you can go and probe how many gravitons you have there or something. I think not not in reasonable future. So yeah, I I will finish in five minutes. So here, what we have done is that the meaning of classical here, because look that now I talk about A and B only, means that. There exists a sequence of dynamical maps AC followed by BC or in reversed order for which 
the dimension of mediator is limited. So, so here on the right, I only take the maximum over all, all states of, of AC such that the C is of dimension at most DC. Whatever, let, let's just, uh, let, me, let me just state uh, the, ba the basic findings. So let me first repeat in this language the usual argument that, it, that why people like to observe entanglement gain for gravitational coupling. So imagine, as, as we usually do, that the initial state is just product, so, so this initial state correlations go away. Now imagine that you have classical interactions in the sense that I just described, that you would be possible to describe this coupling by having AC, then BC, a sequence, a sequence of AC, BC interactions. Then under this, assumptions we, this assumption, we have derived this inequality. And then now further, as, as, as usually has been done in this other paper that I have mentioned, now let's assume that the state of this mediator is classical at all times, which in my language means zero discord, so also zero entanglement. So here I only optimize over states that for which EAC is zero, so I clearly have zero. And this is it, right? So, so you will see, you see that whenever you see that entanglement grows, some of these assumptions are not good. And here we compute it with tanjunk and others, uh, entanglement with, via gravity between particles A and B uh, under taking the quantum Newtonian interactions, so just one over R potential and replacing the position with position operators. And you, you can prove, you can see from those calculations that this entanglement could be even infinite. So really, you know, on a piece of paper, gravity, gravity um, violates this, right? So let's go from the, what would that mean, right? What are the possibilities now? So you could take still classical interactions so that this, this, inequality, this inequality holds, but now you could allow for states that are not necessarily classical. In this case, if you observe entanglement gain, so then it would mean that in your model, you, you, you have to have a possibility of entangling the mediator, hmm, sorry, it should be C, uh, to, to, to the degree that you have observed, which is slightly stronger than, than the statements that, that we, I, have, I was making before, that, which was that entanglement gain would be implying the discord. So now it would imply entanglement. They really try to complete this. And finally, right, you could, you could imagine that you have some, you could assume you have a d-dimensional mediator, then, um, uh, and then you could try to violate this inequality. So note that for any, any d-dimensional mediator, because the calculations show that this entanglement on the left could, is in principle infinite, you would, be, you would be, on a piece of paper, you are, you can show that you can violate the bound. Therefore, you cannot understand gravity as classical interaction with any finite dimensional mediator. So that's, that's really my message here. Gravity cannot be understood as classical interaction with any finite dimensional mediator because you could violate this, this right-hand side bound for any finite DC or D, D mediator. Good, and last minute. So Ray even showed that it's not only that you know that, but actually the amount of violation tells you how far is the dynamical map from a set of uh, these classical maps, let's say in brief, briefly. Good. My conclusions. It is possible to make conclusions about non-classicality of objects about which, you, which are inaccessible. You, you don't have a model for them. How do you do that? You couple them, you put them in the role of mediator between objects which you can measure and you can control. This way, you can determine both non-classical properties of states as well as interactions via mediator. And uh, really, uh, my, one of the, my main messages is that, I, as you have seen in the discrete case scenario, we had a nice bound. And also for this dynamical maps, we had a nice quantitative bound on the amount of non-classicality from the data on AB. However, in terms for states, we don't have that. So, it's, if someone would like to think about it, you know, you are welcome to think on your own. You can also email me, and we can we can think about it together. I think we're really we're missing here a quantitative statement about the amount of I don't know coherence, discord, something like this, of the tripartite state from entanglement gain on A and B only, right? In this case of continuous interactions. Okay, thank you very much. I'm done, <laughs> and managed to. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> That's very interesting. 
Uh, now uh, we have time for questions. Please feel free to ask. I'm trying to share this again. Mm -hmm. Ah, managed to put you to sleep. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is, this is lunchtime in your place, okay. In, in my case, I am after lunch, sorry. <laughs> you are after lunch, okay. No, but still, we have some time. Uh, I suppose there will be some questions. Uh, people can just raise their hands and ask the question directly. So as you see, I have some free slides that I haven't shown, right? Because mm -hmm. you, as another example of this of this tripartite kind of settings, we were mm -hmm. also playing. If you if you look into this paper, we were playing with applying this to, to solid state physics, uh -huh. and then there is this this material, strontium copper oxide, that that people have studied a lot, and and because it's a ITC superconductor, it's and it has this peculiar structure that gives rise to certain dimers and um, okay. so essentially this is, this is really again something similar that you have a spin a spin on one side of a chain a spin on the other side of the chain and and the mediator is the spin chain you can kind of play with this methods in this in this in this setting as well yeah so Yeah, I guess there will be a lot of scope in this kind of uh, thought process, right? Uh, which is not yet been uh, plumbed uh, to their depth, right? Uh, because uh, you really can uh, play around with situations where uh, you, even uh, you're not sure of the exact form of the interaction and things like that. Exactly. Right? Uh, so that, that's the coolest thing. Yes, I think yes. that, um, exactly. So you can, you know, you can have a black box, right? You could have some objects. So this is where these bacteria so were nice, actually. So no one really knows what exactly couples there, but it doesn't matter, right? Something couples. As soon as you see entanglement between things that are coupled through them, Correct. you can say Correct. something about them. How do you envisage, uh, say, for example, have you thought about making use of some of these ideas to say, for example, a quantum heat engine or something like that? No, I ne ne never, never thought about the, this quantum di the thermodynamics. Yeah, I guess. This but I, nice I, can, I can, uh, I can feel that they, it could be made use of yeah. basically. Probably you can say you have a heat, you have a hot, hot, hot reservoir and the cold reservoir, and then there is something in the middle, I suppose. Yes, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, could it could be basically? Yeah, but but you probably usually but don't. But it really needs to be thought about, I suppose. Yeah. So you've been about. basically focusing on these biological things, or you have some? No, on gravity a lot. So we really, we really have, we have really done a lot of works about. So, at first time, so the, gra the gravity was the motivation, right? The, the in so in the first paper we already wrote this about this possible implication. But then I saw this talk by Vladko, so we moved to apply yeah. this to quantum gravity to quantum biology. And then somehow, then with then with Reiner, we we uh, we did these other things. But even even the first paper, although it is really the gravity was the motivation, but then we realized that it really is for any ABC system. So so then I invested some time into trying to put this yes. into into different fields. So that's why we computed this biology. That was why we computed the solid state example. Thermodynamics never crossed my mind. It, yeah, that's probably also a good one. So one should one should try something. Tomek, there is a question here from yes, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, read it in a second. Yeah, you can read it on the chat. I've been wondering if it could show the mediator interaction using IBM quantum uh, lab thing. That's what he says. You can yeah. see that in the chat box. Yes, I think you can. Yes, yes. So this is because this, uh, so they have a pretty specific uh, interaction kind of scheme, right, in, in the IBM, as far as I understand. So yes, you could you could take two qubits that interact via whatever is their interaction scheme, and if you manage to entangle them, you, two, two qubits which are sufficiently 
and which do not interact directly, which I guess is any two qubits in, in, the, circuit in the circuit model that would be. So look, what the assumption here, the only assumption here is that objects A and B do not interact with each other. So you have to choose the two qubits in the circuit model, which you do not couple directly. So for example, let me, let me just share my whole screen and then I show you something on the board. So in, so in your circuit model, you would have some qubit one and some qubit two, and what you are not allowed to do, you cannot couple them like this. That's 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 not allowed by the by by this by the scenario, right? So the only thing you can do is that you have some some other qubits, say, this, or maybe it's better to call it QA to be in the same notation as in my talk, QB and QC, and you can only do this kind of stuff. Right? Maybe again this and whichever 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 sequence but a and b are not allowed right so then so this is allowed and in yeah i think in ibm you can do this right the the two, this kind of two body coupling c knots how can I? Okay, so your, your uh, any other question? Yeah, I have two questions. Can I ask? Yes, yes please. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, talk. Uh, the first question is: uh, Did you try to use your construction uh, in problems related to quantum non-demolition measurement? Also not. <laughs> yes, sir. I should write it down. Your quantum thermo. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and second question. Mention. And why do you think this would this would work? So people, so you measure uh, something, you try to measure yeah. without disturbing yeah. some of the observables. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It. So second question is, uh, what about Heisenberg uncertainty relation? Does it yes. violate? Um, no. This is. So everything I was I was telling here is within a framework framework of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So, yeah, Heisenberg uncertainty is just there because I I haven't moved outside the usual framework. That's a good comment because you know some people have tried to go to go beyond this and and have some especially in the context of gravity it's not clear that this is you know the right thing to do. But note also that if you really have this gravitational mindset. We're talking about two particles that are at rest and that will be somehow attracted to each other gravitationally. And you can prove that even for some osmium, like the most dense materials that, that are there naturally, the, they will move by less than, I think, a nanometer or, or maybe even a picometer within one second. Gravity is that small. So this not relativistic setting I think, I think actually all these entanglement calculations that we have done with Tanjung, they are just kind of what one expects in this kind of experiment. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, thanks. And coming back to, to what Subhashish was saying, right? Yeah, so we started with this, but we also did this, this really gravity is the interesting case, here, right? So with Tanjung, we computed this, this entanglement, right? In between two, two quantum masses. And now with, with Ankit, we, we extended this to, to have some higher order terms included. So yeah, a lot of time it was invested into this as well. I believe this is an experiment that I really hope to see within my lifetime, you know? And it's not so easy to find an interesting experiment that you can see kind of ready within your lifetime. Okay, so uh, are there any further questions? So thanks again. Uh, if not, it was great to, yeah. to be here. <laughs> okay, if not, then yeah, please feel uh, free to uh, get in touch with Tomek if you have any questions uh, by mail and all that. And uh, 
Thanks, Thanks Tomei, once time again time. for the very nice uh, uh, talk and good to see you. And uh, let's hope uh, things get better and we get to meet each other sometimes. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Definitely. Yes, yes. You know, yes. I'm nearby now, so anytime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay then. All the best Thanks very everyone. much. And yeah. bye. And let's also session. thank all the speakers of this session. We'll now come into a close thank of the session. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. thank you. I, I and then uh, we'll meet again after lunch. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye. Thanks again. Our uh, next talk of today's session will start uh, from 3 p.m. again. So, yeah, we are requesting to participants to join the next session after having the lunch.